time, he's going to preach to us out of the Word of God. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you, Brother Thank Alquist. Thank you for being here. Good to be here. It is good. Last time I came, I took Joe Arthur's place. I'd rather be here just taking my place, and uh, I can't be Joe Arthur, that's for sure. Well, it's good to see you. Glad you're here, and uh, good to be back uh, with Grace of Calvary with Brother Alquist. Just a a gracious gentleman. I really didn't know him until three years ago. We'd met, I think, at a sword conference, but I really didn't know him personally. I think that's tucked up around that. <clears throat> there you go. And I need to look as good as I can. All right. And it took me three hours to get ready. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I, I really didn't know him, but I, I just, he's just a good Christian gentleman, you know? And uh, there's something about just being a, a good Christian, ain't there? Huh? You know, I, I'm afraid some of us are are tied into being something else. Just be a good Christian, you know? Just treat each other kindly and be, be nice to each other. Even, even guys like you on the front row, I'd be nice to you. Yeah, one day you may, older, you may, be, you may be taking care of me one day in a nursing home or something, so I'm going to be nice to you. And, uh, but it's good to be here, and it's always good to be with Brother Smith. I appreciate uh, Dr. Smith and the Sword of the Lord. And um, Since I was a teenage boy, I started receiving the Sword of the Lord, and I've received it, I don't know how many years now, I don't even want to try to guess, but, uh, but I'd say well over 40, and, uh, and so I appreciate the sword, appreciate the good message tonight, and uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be here with my cousin. Three years ago I was here, and I mentioned that I was from L.A. That's where my daddy would tell you, if you ask my daddy, where are you from, he always will tell you L.A., and he will allow you to assume Los Angeles unless you ask him any different. At that point, he'll tell you Lower Alabama. And, uh, and so that's where I grew up. So after the service, Brother Shelby Fowler walked up to me and he said, where are you from in L.A.? I said, oh, I'm from Dothan. He said, are you? He said, um, my daddy was from Dothan. I said, what's your last name? He said, Fowler. I said, Fowler. What's your daddy's first name? He said, Raymond. I said, Uncle Raymond? <laughs> I said, did he have a brother named Shelley? Was his daddy named JC or Bob, whatever you want to call great-granddaddy? We found out we his cousins, man. And we had to come to up here where Yankees live to find that out. <laughs> God help us. Anyway... But it's good to be there. And then, then I met the pulpit echoes on his last time. And we've had the other two guys aren't here. So we're just going to have Brother Jeremy next next time to sing for us. And we're just going to leave, leave Brian and Keith at home. But anyway, uh, they, they've sung for us twice since I was here three years ago. Uh, they were just with us a few weeks ago. And, uh, and so, uh, boy, I, I just feel at home and glad to be here. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's good to be around a bunch of preachers. Thank you, preachers, for being here. I know you're busy. You got lots of things you could be doing tonight, like sleeping. And uh, no, but a lot of things you could be doing. And I appreciate you coming. You know, it kind of reminds me of the, uh, you know, me preaching with Brother Smith. You know, that's I, some, every once in a while I pinch myself in the back of my leg and said, is this real? Is this real? You know, kind of reminds me of the young preacher sitting down in the front row. He's going to preach at a preacher's fellowship and older preacher that was going to preach after him and he'd never preached in a preacher's fellowship and he is really nervous and he just really antsy and, and he, he kept just, you know, just fidgety and, and, um, and so older preacher said, just, just trust the Lord, son. Just trust the Lord. It's going to be okay. He said, man, he's all these preachers. He said, these guys, some of these guys have been preaching longer than I've been living. He said, this is unreal. He said, he said, just trust the Lord, son. Just trust the Lord. It'll be okay. He said, yes, sir, I know that. It sounds good. And, um, uh, you know, he said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Anyway, got, got ready to introduce him. And he said, oh, no. He said, I left my Bible in the car. I don't have my Bible, I don't have my notes, I don't have anything. He said, what am I going to do? He said, just trust the Lord, son. He'd go, take my Bible, just trust the Lord. <laughs> so he took his Bible and opened it up, and lo and behold, there was a three-point outline and a poem there. He preached away. I mean, he just ripped and reared and snorted, and man, it was good. He sat down by the old preacher when he was over with him, and the old preacher had said, son, son, that was my sermon for this message. And what am I going to do now? He said, just trust the Lord. Just trust the Lord. <laughs> so, so I've been trusting him trying to get up, get up where I'm supposed to be at. All right. But uh, anyway, I, uh, I'm glad to be here. So I want you to take your Bible and go with me to two places tonight. 
Uh, so if you want to find one in the, or both of them, be fine. I'm going to start in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 1. I will read one verse there. And then we're going to Joshua, chapter number 4. We're going to begin in Ecclesiastes, chapter number 1. And then we're going to Joshua, chapter number 4. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you up front, you're going to have to pay attention on purpose for about the first seven minutes, okay? If you miss the first seven minutes of the sermon, about uh, two or three hours from now, you'll be scratching your head and saying, now what's he talking about right now? And uh, wondering, what is, what is, what's he, that's supposed to have been funny, but nobody laughed. Anyway, uh, <laughs> my favorite service in the week, Sunday night, right? Don't everybody, you like Sunday night? I like, I got saved on Sunday night. I like Sunday night. And I particularly like it over there in the book of Acts chapter 20 at Troas. Paul was long preaching. I like that. Amen. That's Bible. All right. But you're going to have to pay attention. All right. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1. If you found Ecclesiastes 1, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word? And we're going to read this verse and then we'll have prayer and you can be seated. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We're going to look together at verse number 4. Ecclesiastes 1, 4 says, One generation passeth away and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. Now, th there's a truth that all of us in this room tonight understand. We all understand that one generation passes away and another generation comes. There's a, there's a generation in this room tonight. Jesus tarries His coming. 25 years from tonight, they'll not be here. I could be in that generation. But as sure as the sun rises tomorrow in the east, another generation will come if Jesus allows time to go on. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. My, my concern tonight is for that next generation. Matter of fact, would you read that verse out loud together with me? We'll have prayer. You ready? Here we go. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, for the next few moments, I want to communicate your truth, and I ask you to help me in every way to be clear and precise. And Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God would take the Word of God and that he tonight would drive it home to every heart in this building. Whether we're in that older generation, that middle generation, that youngest generation, Lord, may tonight we learn that which you want us to learn, but Lord, may we be more than hearers and learners. May we be doers of the Word. May we obey what you would tell us to do in this hour. May we receive and respond to your Spirit as you speak to us. Lord, I yield myself to you. For these moments, I want to be your message boy. And so I pray you'll help me. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. What, what, what is a generation? I, I'm told that a generation is the span of time from the birth of the mother to the birth of her firstborn. Probably throughout the history of mankind, a generation has composed of somewhere around 20 to 25 years. One generation will eventually pass off the scene, and when that generation passes off the scene, there's always been another generation to take its place. Now, I want you to see those generations with me in a biblical illustration. So go with me to Joshua chapter 4, would you please? Joshua chapter 4, and uh, we're going to look together for a few moments tonight at Joshua chapter number 4, and... Um, we're going to begin reading in verse number 19. Joshua chapter, don't let me hit you, Dr. Smith. Jo Joshua chapter 4, verse number 19. Would you look there with me? Joshua chapter 4 and verse number 19 says, And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal. I love that little word, Gilgal. Uh, word studies is some of my favorite part of scripture study. Now, that little word Gilgal, uh, the children of Israel named the place Gilgal where they came out of the Jordan River because of what it means. It means rolled away. 
They named that place Gilgal because they said that the reproaches of Egypt have been rolled away. Every one of us who are saved tonight, we've had a Gilgal in our life. We, we came to the Lord Jesus and we trusted Him as our Savior. And when we trusted Him as our Savior, the reproach of the old life rolled away. I like that little song the children sing. Rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. Every burden of my heart rolled away. I, I preached this message some years ago and next time our children got up to sing rolled away, they didn't sing rolled away. They sang gil gal, gil gal, gil gal. I'm glad those burdens are all gone because I came to the foot of the cross and my sins were forgiven and I was redeemed and rescued and delivered and my name was written in the book of life and I'm on my way to heaven. I'm heaven bound with a hammer down. Amen. That's old CB lingo for some of you who don't know what that is. All right. Rolled away. They got to Gilgal. It was rolled away. Now what happened? Verse number 20 says, And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. They had taken twelve stones. They'd left twelve stones in the midst of the river. They'd taken twelve stones and put them in Gilgal. And um, they put them there for a purpose. I want you to see it. Verse 21, And he spake, this is Joshua, And the children of Israel saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were gone over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we, go, until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever." They, they took these 12 stones and they set them up as a memorial on the bank of the Jordan. And Joshua said to them, there's going to day come when your children are going to say to you, why, why are these stones here, Dad? Hey, Papa, why did you, why did they put stones here? And he said, when that day comes, he said, I want you to tell them of the great miracle of the crossing of the Jordan River on dry land. Right. You know, I'm afraid of those of us who are familiar with the Bible sometimes, we read about a miracle like that and we just kind of buzz over it. Right. Do you understand that that river stopped flowing? Yeah. Do you understand that that river bottom dried up? Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't go over in the mud. Right. It, 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 was, it was hard baked. That's right. yeah. Millions of them. He said, I want you to tell them that God dried up the Jordan River like he did for us. He said what he did for us was he dried up the Red Sea. Oh, I know the liberals try to make fun of the Red Sea and call it the Sea of Reeds and it's six inches deep. Well, thank God he could drown a whole army and its horses in six inches of water. Amen. You know, you ain't going to take my, my joy away. Amen. <laughs> I don't believe it was the Sea of Reeds. I believe it was the Red Sea, all right? Now, I want you to see these generations. Go back up with me to verse number 21. It says, and he, if you're in a habit of underlining your Bible, I would encourage you to underline the word he, and right above it, I have written in my Bible the number one. He, who is he? He, he is Joshua. I'm going to let... I'm going to let Joshua be represented by this. I probably should move these over. I'm going to let him be represented by that chair right there. He, Joshua. It says, and he spake unto the children of Israel. If, if you're in a habit of underlining, I'd encourage you to underline the children of Israel and write the number two. It's he, Joshua. He's speaking to the children of Israel, that second generation. Who's, who's Joshua? Joshua is the oldest generation. The oldest. There is in this room tonight the oldest generation, and it's really hard for me to admit, but the reality is I'm probably, if I'm not in there, I'm on the edge of going there, all right? I'm 58 years of age tonight, all right? So there's the oldest generation. So this chair represents who? The oldest generation. Joshua, it doesn't matter to me. You, we can call it, we'll call it both. This chair represents who? Joshua, and Joshua represents the 
oldest generation. He's speaking to the children of Israel in this second chair. And, and the children of Israel represent the middle generation. They, they represent some of you in this room tonight. I, I have lived most of my life in that chair, it seems like. It seems like I got in that chair a little early and I lived there a long time, but now I've got seven grandchildren and I reckon I'm sliding over. But, but this, this chair represents the children of Israel and the children of Israel represent the middle generation. So Joshua represents what? Oldest generation. You gotta, if you don't stay with me now, you're not going to understand later. Joshua represents the oldest generation. The children of Israel represent the middle generation. Look at it there. It says, And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children, underline that little phrase, your children, and put the number three up there. It's Joshua, the oldest generation, speaking to the children of Israel, the middle generation, and he said there's going to come a day when this youngest generation is going to ask you a question. So Joshua represents what? Oldest, don't go to sleep now. No need now. Oldest generation. Children of Israel represent the middle generation. And your children represent the youngest generation. They represent who? Youngest generation. So I believe that there should be a concern in all of our hearts tonight for that youngest generation. I realize that the majority of my life has been lived. I was 38 years old when that reality came on me. I was my last few months of being a youth pastor of the church I've been at now for 36 years. And I was with our teenagers in the country of Mexico. And I woke up on my 38th birthday. And that morning while I was having my quiet time with the Lord, it was as if the Lord said to me, you probably lived half your life. I never thought about that before. I, I sat down that morning with my Bible and with a paper and pen and I wrote down some things that I'd want to accomplish if I knew I had only 38 years more to live. Because the reality is one generation passes away. We don't want to admit it. We fight against it. I was telling Brother Smith about a Soul winning man in our states helped us at our North Carolina State Fair over the last several years with amazing grace. Went home to be with the Lord yesterday morning about 91. I told our folks, I said, I can only imagine what it was like when C.B. Boger crossed into heaven and hundreds and thousands of people he led to Christ sitting there waiting on him. <laughs> One generation passes away. What about the next generation? I want you to ponder that question for the next few moments with me. First of all, I want to bring to our attention the stones of our faith. And don't, 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 get, don't get worried, there's not 12 in my sermon, okay? <laughs> the, the stones, what are, what, what are the stones that you and I believe in? I, I start number one, and you can put them in whatever order you want to put them in. I'm not going to argue with you about the order. I start with the scriptures. I, I believe I hold in my hand the infallible, inerrant, completed, preserved word of God. I believe it's the Bible from cover to cover. And as an old woman in South Alabama, you say, I believe the cover too because it says on it, Holy Bible. Yeah, right. I believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. I, I believe as Brother Smith a few moments ago read for us, the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I believe that this book, though it has 66 individual books in it, it has one author and that one author is the Holy Ghost of God and he inspired different men to write what he wanted us to have. The psalmist said in the 119th Psalm, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And I'm going to tell you, the Bible is something I would die for. It's not a preference of mine. It's a conviction. I believe the Bible is the word of God. That's a stone of my faith. It's not an add-on. It's not something I just like and it sounds good. No, it's the Bible, the precious word of 
God. Sharon and I had our oldest of four grandchildren in our home a couple of weeks ago for cousins camp and we had Bible time with Papa uh, six times in those three days and, and I started off teaching them about the Bible. What's the Bible? The Bible's the Word of God. And I taught about the Old the New Testaments and we learned the, we learned the books of the New Testaments and, and uh, we sang them in a little song. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts, Romans, 2 Corinthians, you know. You don't know that great hymn of the faith? But anyway, it's the Bible. That's a stone. That's right. I'm not willing to give in on the Bible. That's right. Let me give you another stone. The sovereign God. I, I believe there's one God. One Lord. Jehovah, it is His name. I believe He is the creator of heaven and earth. I believe He spoke all the world existence in six literal 24-hour day periods. I believe he is the sustainer of the universe and by him Paul said all things consist. I believe tonight if God withdrew his presence for one millisecond, this whole universe would go into utter chaos. He is the creator, the controller, the governor, the ruler. He is God and beside him there is none other. Men may claim to be God and other beings may claim to be God, but there is one God and one God alone and that one God is the God of the Bible. Amen. That's a stone in my life. That's something I settle on. That's something I can rest in. When times get rough and when times get hard and things get difficult, listen to me. He says, I am the Lord. I change not. That's a stone. The stone of the scriptures, the stone of the sovereign God. Let me give you another stone, the Savior. I believe there's just one Savior. Brother John, there ain't a bunch of them. There's one. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, there's not one exception. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You know, I'll tell you what I believe about the Savior. I believe he's virgin born. I don't believe there was a man involved in the conception in the womb of Mary. I believe it was the seed planted by the Holy Ghost. I believe he is virgin born. I believe he lived a sinless life. I don't think Jesus ever had a sinful thought. I don't think he ever said a sinful word. I don't think he ever made a sinful step. I don't think he ever committed a sinful act. I believe he was absolutely sinless. Virtuous in his living. I believe he is vicarious in his death. I believe that when he died on the cross, he died for the sins, hold on a minute, of the whole world. Not a few select to elect. I believe he died for the sins of all mankind. When he suffered on the cross, he died there in my stead and your stead. He took our place and he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I believe he went in the grave and that he was dead, D-E-A-D, -E dead. I don't think he swooned, he fainted. North Carolina, they, there's only one kind of dead people in North Carolina, dead ones. We don't say, well, he's close to dead. No, he's either dead or alive. Jesus died, he was buried. Oh, but good news. <laughs> At third morning, <laughs> He came up out of the, up from the grave. He arose with a mighty victory over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Amen. He came out of that grave victoriously, gloriously, triumphantly. I believe 40 days later he ascended back into heaven. The angel said there on the top of the mount, had this same Jesus, not another one, this same Jesus taken up from you, come in like manner as you see him go. Because I believe he's about to come again. I've been preaching through the book of the Revelation for about the last uh, 16, 17 months on Sunday morning. And, and uh, boy, I'm telling you this over and over again. A while ago, I think Brother Alquist, I think, said, uh, we're, we're living in a time where it's about to happen. Uh, you know, about, about um, I don't know, we're, we just finished chapter 16 Sunday, so I, maybe three or four, five, six weeks ago, we, we were there about the mark of the beast, and, and I was talking about some things I'd read about the national ID card, and I said, you know, I'm not telling you that's the mark of the beast, I'm just telling you, we're lined up for it, and it wasn't two weeks before this company up in Wisconsin began to put it microchips in people's little spot right there so they can scan in and out. Hey, listen to me. I, I don't know that's the mark of the beast, but I'll tell you what, it's conditioning people to receive the mark. 
See, I believe he's coming back. I believe he's coming back. What a wonderful, glorious day it'll be. That's a stone. It's the stone of the scriptures, the stone of the sovereign God, the stone of the Savior. I'll give you another stone, the stone of salvation. I believe all people need to be saved. And I believe God loves everybody, red, yellow, black, and white. Listen to me. This mess in Charlottesville this weekend, listen to me. God loves people because he made them. He, God made us various colors because God loves diversity. Can you imagine if we were all redheaded how terrible it would be? <laughs> hey. Listen to me, I, average Sunday morning, and if you walk in our service, there's going to be somewhere between 25 and 30 different nationalities of people sitting in our auditorium. I was raised in Alabama. I know what prejudice is. I was raised in it. But the gospel has no, the gospel's colorblind. <laughs> See, I believe salvation, everybody needs it and anybody can get it. I love that verse, don't you? Romans 10, 13, for whosoever. I, I'm telling you, if God has already predetermined, preselected some people to go to hell and other people go to heaven, it, God was mighty cruel, keep using that word, whosoever. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, I believe that's the stone, the stone of the scriptures, the stone of the sovereign God, the stone of the Savior, the stone of salvation. Now, hold on a minute. I preached this before, Brother Smith. It's not going to be quite as loud as it's been being. There's another stone over here. It's a stone of separation. See, I believe that in order to preserve the stone of the scripture, the sovereign God, the Savior, and salvation, God ordained for us to come out from among them and be ye separate. You say, I don't like that separation. You know, that, that word's got a really bad connotation to most of us. No, 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 no. You know, listen to me. That, that word's more about love than it is about hate. Loving the truth, hate and error. Loving righteousness, hate and unrighteousness. Loving holiness and hate and ungodliness. I mean, I mean, Titus, when Paul wrote to Titus, he, he said that God made us a peculiar people, Zaius of good works, and he told us that the grace of God would teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world. God intended for his people to reflect his character. God intended for us. We, we didn't go to 1 Peter but if we went to 1 Peter over there, you know what it said over there in chapter 1, verse 16? Be ye holy even as I am holy. You know, we, we, we think it just says that in Leviticus eleven forty four. 44. It does. But God knew we needed it in the New Testament. So he said, be ye holy even as I am holy. God desires for you and I to be able to, when we testify and tell others of him, that our life would back up what our lips are saying. I think a lot of us have little power when it comes to soul winning because there's not much distinction in our life. And I believe that if you're going to pass on those other stones, you have to pass on the stone of separation. Now I understand, and please I'll give you some liberty here. I understand we may not dot every I and cross every T alike. But I do know this, that a stone of what I believe is it makes a difference in how I live. And it only makes a difference in how I live because I'm different in who I am. Those are stones. Those are stones that I'm interested in chair number three getting a hold of. Now, I've got seven little ones. Ones that can talk, the five that can talk plain. Call me Papa and I want them to know where Papa stands. But I want to go beyond that. I want them. So we see the stone. Secondly, I want you to see the strategy. Satan's strategy to ruin the stones. See, Satan despises every one of those stones. He hates the scriptures. He hates God. He hates Jesus. He hates salvation. And he sure hates separation. 
So Satan has a strategy. How, how does Satan seek to destroy the stones? Or at least to make them a little loose in somebody's life. Number one, he exploits the oldest generation. Now stay with me. That oldest generation, I want to think of one beyond me, okay? My dad's still living, so I can think of one beyond me easy. That oldest generation believes some things, and they pass those things on to us, but the older they get, the more difficult it is to hold on to those things. See, there's a natural tendency in us to soften as we get older. You know, you know I, I looked my children in the face. I have two boys and one normal child. And, and I looked them in the face and I'd say to them without any hesitation, this is right, this is right, you're going to do it. But even at 58 years of age, I'm honest enough to admit, that doesn't come as easy to my grandchildren. I, I call it the grandparent syndrome. Shelby will know my grandmother. She's in heaven now, Maud Fowler, which is his aunt. My grandmother, when I was a little boy, my, my grandparents had two children. They had my mother and a, and, a, and a son. My mother's nine years older than my uncle. And, and so when I was little, and, and then my top of that, my uncle didn't get married. My mother got married when he was 18. My, when she was 18, my Uncle didn't get married. He's 27. So there's a gap between me and my first cousin. I mean, a pretty good gap. I don't know how many years, 20 years maybe, uh, 25. And so there's a pretty good gap. So when, when I grew up in my grandmother's house, she had rules. N number one, you didn't come out of the kitchen with a Pepsi Cola. Okay? You, you stayed in the kitchen. You didn't come out of the kitchen with a Pepsi Cola. I mean, she had rugs. We didn't have no door, wall to wall carpet. She had rugs. And you weren't going to spill no Pepsi on her rug because if you did, she was going to put the Board of Education on the seat of learning, all right? right. And it's going to be a heated conversation. <laughs> I live with them. I used to go down almost, when I got older, probably almost every Friday night when I was about 8 to 13 years of age, and they'd always buy Nip Murnie's hot dogs. They'd always buy Kentucky Fried Chicken Coleslaw, and uh, we'd play dominoes, Amen. And uh, I live by my grandmother's rules. Well, my uncle's oldest girl, Kim, we were at my grandparents. We always did Christmas on Christmas Eve at my grandparents. I'm sitting over in the easy chair by my granddaddy. And I see Kim. I don't know. She's six, seven years old. I don't know. I'm my late 20s. She comes out of the kitchen with a Pepsi Cola. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting there thinking, precious memories. <laughs> and she spills the Pepsi Cola. Now, we ain't got rugs no more. We got wall to wall carpet now, okay? And here comes my grandmother out of the kitchen, just like I knew it was going to be. But she ain't got no belt, she ain't got no bolo paddle. She's got a towel. And the next thing I know, she's down on the floor drying up the Pepsi Cola. I'm telling you, it started in my feet, come up to my head. Before I knew it, I jumped out of that chair and I said, Get her, Grandma! Get her! She said, Get her about what, Tim? I said, She spilled Pepsi Cola on your carpet. She needs a whipping. <laughs> oh, it's going to be okay, Kim. Kim, it's going to be all right. We're going to get it up. <laughs> See, Satan knows that. And you know what he'll do with some of you gray heads in here tonight? He'll make you feel sympathetic toward that youngest generation and say, well, you know, I don't know if the preacher ought to preach on that. I wonder if he, I don't know if sure he ought to mention that. Somebody's probably going to get their feelings hurt. 
See, see Satan's strategy is, a, is to exploit this oldest generation. Now let me tell you what he does with this middle generation. He neutralizes the middle generation. He neutralizes them. What do you mean? He, he makes it so this middle generation doesn't stand for or against anything. B Billy Sunday said you can't love flowers unless you hate weeds. And you can't love Jesus unless you hate sin. Hey, listen to me. There, there is no place for neutrality in the life of a believer. But he, he, he gets this second generation and, and he gets them neutral. Hey, listen to me. That, that old generation, you know when they used to preach when I was a boy growing up, Brother Jay? They used to preach a, a praying knee and a dancing foot don't grow on the same leg. That's right. And them old gray heads, they'd sit there and go, wow, glory, oh, glory. But now that middle generation is saying, well, you know what? If I want my, my daughter to have some charming grace, shouldn't I take her to ballet? No, I'll put a book on top of her head and tell her to walk without it falling off. Amen. See, that oldest generation said, Wines of mocker, strong drinks raging. Whosoever deceived thereby is not wise. For that middle generation, they may drink moderately or socially, whatever that means. Satan just neutralizes them. They're not for anything and they're not against anything. The honest truth is, most of us Bible-believing Baptist people, we've lost militancy. There's some millennials in here tonight, so don't cut me out and cut me off. Hey, but there, there's something about contending earnestly for the faith which once delivered to the saints. And in that faith is separation. We had a governor years ago. Matter of fact, we had him four times. He got elected, reelected. He couldn't get reelected again, so he didn't run the next time. But he didn't run the next time. He got elected and reelected. When I joined the staff of Beacon Baptist Church in 1981, he was the governor. In 1979, in the state of North Carolina, my pastor and about seven or eight other pastors were just a few hours from going to prison for operating a church school. And our governor finally signed the bill, and it's supposed to be the Magna Carta of the of Christian school law and all that kind of thing. But, but when I came, even though it had been a couple years ago, they were still in our office on a billboard, a little bulletin board thing, an editorial cartoon. In the first caption, it had Governor Hunt combing all his hair to the right, and underneath it, it said, Some of my friends are for Christian schools. In the next caption, it had him combing it all to the left, and he said, some of my friends are against Christian schools. The third and final caption had him coming it right down the middle. And he said, and I stand with all my friends. <laughs> now that, that's okay for a politician, I reckon. <laughs> but that ain't good for a preacher. That's not good for a, a parent. See, Satan exploited the oldest generation. Satan neutralizes the middle generation. Then you know here. Now you listen to me and listen to me well. He captures this youngest generation. You know why? Because they hadn't been taught Bible of any hadn't been taught Bible reasons about anything mom and daddy believes. They may still believe it. They may still practice some of it. But they've not communicated to this youngest generation why and how. And so Satan comes in and he takes this one and just snatches it. Right out of the, that, that's, that's, the reason, that's the reason when they leave high school they're not coming back to our churches. It's not their fault. You know, that's what we want to do. Come on now. It's going to get quiet here. We want to blame it on them. Give you four more things, I'm going to be done and gone. I'll let you leave here. This clock says it's 4.30, so I reckon i got a few hours. <laughs> I'm going to give you, last of all, the steadying. How do you steady the stones? What, 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 what can you and I do in order to keep the stones steady 
in our lives, in our families, in our churches. Number one, realize Satan is your enemy and not your friend. Satan is not a friend of grace. Satan is not a companion in righteousness. Satan despises the righteousness of Christ and the righteousness of Christians and Satan will do everything he can to destroy it in your life and my life, in your home and my home, your family, my family, your church, my church. We need to understand he is what Peter said. He is our adversary. And as a roaring lion, he walketh out seeking whom he may devour. And he ain't picky. He'll take the pastor's children, the deacon's children, the Sunday school teacher's children, the bus captain's children. He'll take the Christian school's children. He'll take any and all. He is not picky. He does not care. He is fine to take anybody a captive. He's our enemy. He's not our friend. And listen to me. You, you can't coddle him. And he stayed calm. No, he's a roaring lion. He's not a pussycat. So, so if you and I are going to steady the stones in our lives, families, and churches, we've we got to, number one, understand that he is our enemy. Number two, we've got to draw the line straight in our home. Did you hear me? I said draw the line straight in your home. Sharon, I don't have the privilege to have children in our home every day anymore. They've grown up and gone away. But I'm telling you, some of the best days of our lives were the years that we had those children and every day under our watch care and love and I be able to instruct and teach. And I'm telling you, I, I, I determined with, that I wasn't going to go to heaven with other people's children and leave my, my children behind. I was going to do everything in my power. I know they're free moral agents, and I know they got a will they can choose for their own, but I was going to do everything in my power to tell them what I believe, why I believe it, and show it from the Bible. And listen to me, friend. You do yourself a favor if you would just be honest with your children. If you can't show it in the Bible, say, this is what I believe based on some principles in the Bible. Some of us have done a disservice to our youngest generation by making things that we think are Bible aren't Bible. You don't have to like me. I'm, I'll leave tomorrow night, okay? So I. But you know where the line needs to be strong, drawn straight first? At home. Hey, Daddy. Daddy. God didn't give your pastor your children. God gave them to you. Hey, I'm glad to be the pastor of hundreds of children. And I thank God for the opportunity to influence families for God and for right. But listen to me. They're not my children. I'm not a surrogate parent. I've had a few long life journey of ministry that I've had to do some things for I didn't do for others, especially when I was a youth pastor and they have parents that, that were not saved or real carnal. And the honest truth, listen to me. Any guys in the youth ministry, just give you a little tidbit of wisdom here. I'd rather have a teenager in my youth group that had unsaved parents than carnal parents. Because <laughs> I'd preach on the wickedness of liquor and unsaved daddy would say, well, you know what, I think Mr. Raven's probably right. And a carnal parrot said, you know, that's just Mr. Rabin's opinion. <laughs> you got to draw it line straight, Daddy. Mama, you got to stand by him. Shoulder to shoulder. When our kids were little, we taught them the words. That's what we called them. Well, we really didn't call them the words until our baby girl came along. She named them the words. So we called them the words. You say, well, the words. Well, I'll give you the words. I'd say the Bible is the word of, and they'd all yell out, God. And I'd say the Bible's about, and they'd say, Jesus. And I'd say, Jesus is the son of, they'd say, God. And I'd say, where God's at? And they'd say, up in heaven. And I'd say, cigarettes. And they'd say, bad, bad. I'd say, cigarettes. They'd say, no, no. I'd say, girls wear. And they'd say, dresses. And I'd say, boys wear. They said, pants. I'd say, girls have. And they'd say, long hair. I'd say, boys have. They'd say, short hair. And I'd say, going to movie theater is. And they say, bad, bad. Going to movie theater is. No, no. Drinking beer is bad, bad. And then the, I don't know why, but we did this. I hate beer. They could all stay up they loved it because they could stand up in devotion I hate beer I hate beer then I say, whiskey is bad bad whiskey is no no and you know what that made that made happen every once in a while for Nick what that made happen is 
you'd be in the grocery store buying groceries and some dude's got beer in his buggy and one of your sons would look over at him and said, beer, bad, bad. I hate beer. I hate beer. He's thinking, what does this four-year-old know about beer? And so Sharon and I would say to him, shh, we don't believe that in here, son. We don't believe that in here, son. No, no, we didn't. We would get down to him and say, that's right. We believe beer is bad. God's against it. That man probably doesn't know that. We need to pray for him. Back when they used to have the cigarette machines in the restaurants, you know. They'd go by, cigarettes, bad, bad, cigarettes, no, no. <laughs> you say, how they knew what a cigarette was? Well, their mother showed them. But anyway, I'm, I'm joking. But listen to me. It's not your pastor's. Hey, you know what? You know what I wanted to do when I served on staff for 16 years at the church I'm at? You know what I wanted to do? I wanted my children to sit under my pastor's preaching. So when he preached, we'd go home and they say, you know what? Preacher Cox believes just like you do, Daddy. Yeah. I told my kid, we have, our church has a church school. All three of my children started K-5, graduated 12th grade. But you know what I tell their, tell their teacher every year? I'd say, listen, we're glad that Tim, Philip, or Joy is going to be in your class. But we just got them here so you reinforce what we're teaching at home. Number one, realize Satan is enemy. Number two, draw the line straight at our home. Number three, quickly, demand our leaders to live consistent. Hey, listen to me. If you're, you're, you're a layman here tonight, thank you. God bless you. If it wasn't for you, church like Grace of Calvary Baptist Church would not go on. It could not be run by just a few paid staff people. But the reason Pastor Alquist or any pastor, if you're from another church, the reason they have leadership standards, requirements, is because they want to send a consistent sound. Amen. Paul said to the Corinthian church, if, if a bugle gives an uncertain sound, who's going to come to the battle? Now, listen to me. Every church ought to have some standards for their leadership. It may not be the same, and you may not agree with all the words while ago. Don't get caught up in, I don't agree with that one year, say, i <laughs> I don't care if you agree with every one of them or not. I'm, I didn't parent your children. I parented mine, okay? But don't get caught up in some little <laughs> insignificant. But if you're a leader in a local church, you ought to live right and do right. I mean, it'd be a shame. It'd be a shame for a little boy or a little girl goes to your Sunday school class, see you going down the grocery store with beer in your cart. It'd be a shame for them to see on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram some ungodly place you're at. I, I, I preached a sermon, something like what I'm preaching tonight. I'd been the pastor of our church, I think, about three months. I got up on my soapbox, and back in those days, I yelled and screamed, hollered, spit. Everything moving, I shot it twice, make sure it's dead. One of our men came out that night, and I'll never forget it. He took me by the hand. He said, Pastor, he said, I don't agree with everything on that you practice in your life. But he said, I want to thank you for two things. I said, okay. He said, number one, he said, I want to thank you that you do what you say. I've never in whatever years, 16, 18 years, ever seen you inconsistent in what you were trying to do and what you preached tonight. And number two, I appreciate you still believing them and telling them. Now that's Almost 20 years ago will be, I think, January or February. You know what he is tonight? Is this, on, this is on live stream here. I'll just say he's a deacon then. He, he's a deacon in our church. You know what he tonight does? He believes all those things I believe. Amen. He's reared his family like that. That way, all three of them gone to Christian college, graduated. Fellas, keep on demanding it. Because the last point is, here it is, and I'm through. Keep preaching line upon line, precept upon precept. Amen. It's not easy. 
Hey, listen to me. There, there's a lot of things I could have preached tonight, and you walked out of here and said, Woo, that's good. <laughs> Some of you walk out of here not as mad as you can be. <laughs> that's all right. I'm your friend. I'm not your enemy. Amen. I promise you. A man tells you the truth not not angry that's at you. Right. He's loving towards you. That's right. See, see. I believe they're worth it. I believe they're worth it. I'm not fighting for me. My time's about up. 20 years, 30 years, I'll be gone. Distant memory to a lot of people. They'll still be living if Jesus tarries. And they're going to be the deacons in our church, and they're going to be the pastors in our pulpit. I want to read you a letter. My wife, it's not really a letter, it's, a, it's an incident. And after it happened, I told her, I said, I really want you to put this down so I'll never forget it. It's dated. It's dated March the 20th, 1998. Sharon entitled it, The Sad Testimony of a Lady I Visited Last Evening on Thursday Night Soul Winning. And I'll just read it. She could quote the scriptures from Romans 3.10 to 10.13. That head knowledge was there. And as she spoke, these are words that best Sharon could remember. She said, she said, uh, I was reared in Baptist pastor's home. I was very active in the church. I played the piano. I participated in the different singing groups. In my older teen years, early 20s, my dad worked on his seminary degree. He finally made it to graduation. We were so proud of him. One day as dad was preaching, he mentioned that the story of Adam and Eve was an allegory. That afternoon I asked my dad, why was the story of Adam and Eve real when I was a little girl, but now it's an allegory? My dad replied, we've learned so much more about the Bible since those days. And she said, immediately the stones in my life began to crumble. I couldn't understand why things had changed. She said, I'm 50 years old now, I'm Catholic I attend services occasionally to make me feel better spiritually. I realize Baptists were too narrow-minded. I do believe there's some spiritual being somewhere. I know now there's many contradictions in the Bible. I don't need anyone to shed his blood and die for me. I've never done anything that bad. If I need help, I'll die for myself. Then my wife wrote this little note. It is our responsibility as parents to steady the stones for our children. We must steady the stones lest this testimony have our children's name signed on it someday. I'm asking you tonight, what are you doing to pass your faith on to the next generation? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you that you use your word in hours like this to correct us and challenge us and change us. Lord, I realize that across this auditorium tonight, we probably don't all agree on every preference and standard. But Lord, help us to be firm what we believe about your word and you and your son, our salvation, the separation we ought to have from this world. And help us, dear Lord, there in that oldest generation, that middle generation, not to give in to the ploy of the devil, but help us to remain firm and committed, faithful and true. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. They may get a song ready, may play a piano, whatever they need to do. I want to ask you to stand, would you please? God spoke to us about steadying the stones. We can't stop Satan from seeking to destroy the stones. We can't hinder him from attacking us, attacking our children, our grandchildren, our churches. But we sure can do our part to steady the stone. Maybe tonight you just need to slip from your place and find a place of prayer and say, Oh Lord, 
I will do my part. Whatever my part is as a mom, a dad. Maybe you're a teenager. Maybe you need to say to the Lord tonight, Lord, I want to receive what my parents are passing on to me. Maybe you're a young boy, a girl, and you say, I don't want to understand all you said tonight, but I sure want to receive the faith that my parents have and my grandparents had. You have a heritage like that. You may be a pastor. You say, I've got weary in the battle, Brother Ray, but I understand. Oh, friend, I understand. But that generation's worth it. Maybe you just need to find a place of prayer and say, Lord, I want to keep preaching it. I want to keep drawing the line straight. Whatever God's dealt with you about, would you deal with it now? Maybe the previous message reminders to be watchful and advised and soul conscious. Would you just do what God wants you to do? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this message we've just heard and for the previous message, how they've spoken to our hearts. We thank you for your word, Lord. It gives us these principles, these truths, these timeless realities. And Father, we thank you for preserving your word for every generation. We got the same Bible, the same word as our previous forefathers and generations. And so, Father, help us not to stray from it. Help us not to, to try to water it down or fancy it up. Help us just to preach the word as it is to men as they are, to let it do its work, to allow your Holy Spirit to have his way in our hearts and lives and in our preaching and in our churches. Father, we need a revival in America. And Father, each one of us in this room could stand to have that revival begin in our hearts, in our churches. And Father, if you could just send your Holy Spirit in a special way in these last days to Father, do something miraculous and supernatural. Something that men would know came from heaven, came from God. Father, something that would get yourself a name all around this country and would turn your people out for the Lord Jesus and out from among the, uh, all these places and out of all these things into the house of God to worship you in spirit and in truth and to go out into the highways and hedges and compel others to come in. Father, what a, what a movement, what a glorious thing that there'd be millions more that would go when Jesus says, come up hither, we could take some with us. Father, we can't do it. If you don't do it, it won't get done. If you don't bless us, we're not blessed. If you don't enable us, we're not enabled. Father, if you don't give, we don't get. We just come to you tonight and thank you for all these things we've heard and look forward to hearing what we hear tomorrow. Thank you, my Father, for loving us so much to speak to us through your servants and to minister to our hearts tonight. We thank you and praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to take your hymn books, if you would, please. I'm going to have Mark come. We're going to sing uh, 800 and, where is that? Um, victory. 812. 812. And as we do, I just want to thank you, Brother Raven, for that message. And um, just w one little testimony, if I may. Um, I was thinking when he was talking, I was talking with someone about a year ago, someone I had taught, someone I had trained for years, and uh, they're at a place in their life now where they're, you know, they don't hold the same standards that I hold, they don't see things the way I see them, and we were just talking on the phone, and I said to this individual, I said, you know, I, you know I've been thinking about kind of loosening it up on some of the standards and maybe some of the music, you know, and just kind of getting with it a little more. 
there was shock on the other side of the phone. And that person said, no, 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 no. I, I think you ought to think about that. I don't think you should do that. And what, what it said to me was, they've moved away, but preacher, they need you to stay. They need to be able to look somewhere and see a rock. And they need to be able to see somebody standing where they used to stand, still standing there. That means a lot to them. You're kind of like an anchor. I know Jesus is the anchor of our soul, but sometimes you're the anchor to their life here on earth. And they need to look back and say, he's still there. Because you know what? That tells them they can come back. So hang in there, preachers. Love you and want you to just do everything you can for Jesus. Let's sing 812, please.